greetings from Ireland and to all the friends and fans and readers, everybody who was attending the summit. Um, yeah, so today we're going to talk about uh, web-based OSINT tools and techniques and <clears throat> how to use them to investigate uh, phishing campaigns. I have a couple of slides here for you. Um, here we, um, I guess, the, the introduction here, uh, you know, how bad is phishing? What is phishing? Unfortunately, we all know what it is. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a social engineering attack. It happens the whole time, every day to practically anybody who's online. Uh, it's a mass distributed email or text message uh, attack that has malicious links and <clears throat> the objective is to steal user information, um, credentials, financial info, and so on. 90% um, of these breaches happen, uh, of the data breaches happen as a result of phishing, and it could lead to more serious events like ransomware and malware. And the conservative assessment uh, is that uh, you know, every 15 to 20 seconds, there's a new phishing URL popping up somewhere and it's being used in these campaigns. So it's good to um, have a, uh, an idea of how, how to investigate this, how to defend against them. Um, here we can see, you know, from the most basic crude phishing attempts to some more sophisticated ones, like crafted ones that you can't really spot um, a phishing link. And sometimes you can. Um, so... Uh, Yeah, um, here we have um, the methodology outline, I guess, which um, the way I do it. And uh, again, there's no right or wrong way of doing it. It's just, this is what comes handy. So uh, I normally start with um, looking at the basic uh, website IP address identification, you know? So the basic who is basically um, reputation check. What do we know about this, this threat? Is it a new campaign or is it something that's been there for, for a while? Um, is it a known threat or unknown? Um, what else is hosted on the um, IP address that is uh, hosting these uh, malicious websites? What DNS can be found? Um, you know, are the URLs shortened? How is this uh, propagate? You know, how is how, how the whole campaign spreads? And finally, we have subdomain enumeration. So we're just going to quickly work through um, these these aspects of the. Um, of, of this investigation methodology. So the basic who is record uh, would include, include typically details such as, you know, where the website is hosted, uh, what IP address it is, who the registrant is. Although nowadays this is uh, private mainly because of GDPR and other changes that have happened, but there are ways to look at the historical sort of DNS records to go back and see who owned the website previously. That might give some clues. Um, reputation. Uh, what the website uh, was observed uh, previously in, 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 in engaging in, like, is it, you know, was it used for staging malware? Was it used for spamming um, malicious links, emails, or what kind of other websites are being hosted uh, near to it? Um, you know, if you, uh, an investigator would come across a shortened uh, link, it's possible to sort of unravel that link by adding a plus symbol at the end of the URL in the right in the browser tab. Now, well, of course, this will depend on other uh, URL shortened services like uh, Bitly, for example, could be a different one. Um, you know, uh, hyphen question mark tilde uh, added at the end of these different links are also legitimate symbols to unravel um, these links. Or you can just go head over to web-based tools to, um, you know, utilize those to unravel the links automatically without any input to the URL. Subdomain uh, enumeration is very curious. As you can see here, uh, I have an example of uh, a malicious domain that um, on the um, second level domain is, remains the same. So you, you can see it's some kind of a, a banking uh, phishing URL, but it, it, you can enumerate different uh, subdomains there. So we see different names of different banks hosted on the, the same um, uh, second level domain. So this is used to attack various customers of these various packs in, in different ways. And it, it's, I guess, it's, it's um, you know, the objective here is for the malicious actor to save money. It's, it's to simplify their process by creating subdomains uh, from the second level of domain so that they don't have to go and create these individual entities, you know, every single time. You don't have to create a, a phishing domain that is dedicated to a specific site so they can use... Um, they can use uh, the subdomain that is dedicated. Um, yeah, so 
The next step typically is to examine the, um, the technology stack behind the website. So what is the website built with, right? What kind of cert security certificate does it have? Does it have Google Ads? Does it have any trackers? Is it an open directory website? Um, can you estimate website traffic, you know, favicon examination or HTML uh, value? So these are all kind of further down the line questions that you could, you could ask as, as part of your methodology. Um, and again, you know, the, you, can, you can look at these technology stacks by uh, using online tools like uh, uh, built with or web tech survey, or you can uh, go deeper and you, you can do it manually um, for the more, more advanced people. Um, you know, you're looking for instances of repetition, basically, you know, are these copy templates from somewhere else, the components of the website, how is the website created, uh, you know, what other websites they link to, if they do, uh, you know, are they malicious websites and campaigns that are known again, are they new coming back, have we seen this before? Um, when it comes to analyzing the website uh, offline, uh, you can download it by using HD track. This is very beneficial if you have like uh, images or files of interest for, um, for example, that you want to look at metadata from it. As we know, social media nowadays, you know, they remove data uh, metadata by default. So you can't really get a lot of information that way. But if somebody uploads it to a website, you know, there could be chances are that there could be metadata in those files. Um, so if here, for example, we see um, yeah, an open directory uh, website and basically, you know, a lot of phishing websites, malware websites, this is the format that they use, you know, they come in open there, which is open directory format, display all these various files of interest that as an investigator, you might want to look at, and you can just grab them there, you know, you can grab the whole website. So um, again, there, there's ways, there's ways of doing this, and I'll get to that at, at the end, because I'll have, I'll have a list of all these tools for you. So I'll link it um, at the end of the presentation. But yeah, you know, from there, we can go towards uh, looking at security certificates. Um, so a lot of the uh, scammers and uh, malicious um, fishers, you know, these bad actors, they abuse free services like Let's Encrypt. So sometimes you can um, get really a lot of information from analyzing security certificates. AdWords, you know, Google Ads uh, IDs, do, do, does the website have any Google Ads or AdWords uh, trackers in the, in the code, you know? So you, you can have a look at this by uh, basically browsing the source code of a website. Um, and then the last two, I just want to spend a bit more time on it, um, which is the favicon and HTML hash value um, examination. So here we go. Um, so basically the purpose of doing this is to uh, calculate the HTML code uh, value of the website as we're as we're looking at it. Okay, so for this, I I, I tend to use uh, Linux uh, terminal command uh, Kali in this case, and the curl command followed by the website of interest with the, with the www dot whatever website this is, uh, with a pipe symbol and a hash checksum, which this command will allow you to um, calculate the HTML code hash. And the reason for doing this is because a lot of these websites, uh, you know, they come in sort of carbon copies of other websites. The code is ripped. The code, is, code, the code is being re repeated because, you know, this is basically a, an organized campaign. So you have to sort of think about this saying, okay, what else can I find using this? You know, what other websites can I find? So if you uh, grab the hash value of, of, of the HTML code of a website that you just computed, and by the way, it doesn't have to be uh, the SHA uh, algorithm it could be, you know, SHA-1, MD5, et cetera. It doesn't have to be, it's whatever you can pick. And then you can put that value into a, 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 a site that allows to search for these parameters like URL scan, for example, right? And here we see straight away, we have a lot of different websites just popping up like that. And they could be part of the same campaign. They could be part of a different campaign. Um, we don't know, right? But that is the whole point of investigating this. You know, how big is this campaign? How widely spread is? How many targets it would have, and so on. So let's move over to the Favicon, and here we go. So Favicon, uh, again, many people probably know it from visually browsing websites. It's that little small icon displayed in the browser tab next to the name of the website. Okay, so um, we can find these. Um, 
favicons by basically browsing the source code. So as you see highlighted over here, typically a favicon will have the .ico file extension. It will be, you know, the link to it will be embedded in there somewhere. Um, and, you know, it will display, um, it will, the, 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 you can basically grab the URL of the website. So what, a lot of the times what happens here is that, you know, scammers and fishers, they, they grab the code of the legitimate website to impersonate it. You know, Favicon is used legitimately for, you know, helping brand recognition or whatever, but this is used here to make it appear like this is a legitimate site. Uh, so what, what, what that you can do, you can, you can go and calculate the Favicon um, value, you know, another web uh, using web-based tools. You can then uh, you can then grab the hash of that favicon and you can use, for example, Showdown or a similar tool to see, okay, what else comes up online for the same exact favicon? And you will get the legitimate site and then you'll get these, you know, impersonator sites as well. So that's, that's, that's handy. Um, okay, live interaction. So, you know, you, you probably can't beat live interaction when it comes to... Um, Doing this and this is like a spontaneous sort of a engagement with the website so basically you open up uh, a page uh, by you know opening the develop developer tools you're looking at some sort of a source code in the right panel or left or whichever you want structured and then you interact with the website by putting in digits or by putting in some name or you know trying to log in and seeing what happens and as you can see here in, in this case what happens you suddenly get this link uh, in preview which you know leads to a Telegram account, right? So somebody left contact details there. You know, this was the author of the fish kit in this case, who actually wrote the template for the, the malicious website. And you know, you can you can contact them for for help assistance. Um, yeah. So we have a couple of uh, threats on the horizon, I guess, because phishing is sort of an, an evolving trend, and you know, it's expanding. And three things I want to focus on here are the browser in the browser attack, the implementation of CAPTCHA in phishing websites, and the kind of fake notifications, including on the mobile devices. Yeah, so, okay, browser in the browser attack. So here we have an example of phishing attack that it creates, um, you know, creates an exact copy of, of the website that it's trying to impersonate. And it's very, very hard. It's impossible to just see, you know, with the naked eye to go, okay, this is legit or not. Um, perfect match on the URL. And the trick is that it uses the iframe elements um, to impersonate, you know, the site that you are trying to log into. Uh, and yeah, like I said, it's very hard to, you know, just recognize this, but there are mitigations against it. And, you know, two-factor authentic authentication, multi-factor authentication, for example, you know, tokens or, apps that allow you the codes to go in. Password Manager is a big one. Um, and it's actually part of um, a detection uh, system for this because there's two ways you can detect these sites. So first way is the same way as you detect any other phishing sites through checking the reputation, past activity, DNS, and so on. Um, Password Manager, very handy because if the credential don't auto populate, so you visit this phishing site and you already have a Password Manager, um, that is meant to populate your login credentials, but it doesn't work. Okay, there's something wrong. You know, what could be? You know, this is the phishing website. And uh, that could be an indication. Um, yeah, uh, here we have CAPTCHA in the phishing websites. And again, this is not like an entirely new attack, but it's constantly evolving. And basically the, the use of CAPTCHA for, for websites, uh, phishing websites is that um, you know, the idea is that this is a bot detection mechanism. So what the malicious actor will do, they implement the CAPTCHA on the phishing website. Uh, the website link will be processed through some sort of a scanner, you know, especially if it's a company that is being attacked. So they might have a firewall, they might have some sort of a, a phishing filter and, you know, the AI or, or just the automation automated system behind it is unable to resolve the CAPTCHA because they're a bot, okay? So the way to deal with this uh, from the OSINT side is that uh, you have to realize the recaptcha uh, API uses a certain element in the URL and there's a parameter of that you can grab that you can then check for against the presence of it on other websites or somewhere else online. So you can again do this like I uh, mentioned earlier, view page source code at 12 or whichever, uh, take a look at the HTML code. You can actually even go control find Search for recapture, recapture response, recapture callback, stuff like this. 
a string will appear, you know, and bingo, you have it. Um, so that's another way to deal with it. And the last one I have to show you here is just the fake browser notifications. And this can be very annoying. And I've uh, seen people, you know, especially elderly users get caught with this the whole time because suddenly you have this notification come up on the phone or the browser. And, you know, what is it? Like, it doesn't look malicious, um, but, you know, people don't know and they click the link and, you know, the drama happens. So um, users are basically duped to sort of click allow on this because your browser is configured nowadays in such a way that you have to allow for these notifications to be displayed. So people sort of don't know what they're doing. They don't realize this is phishing and then they get caught. So the mitigation is to just block notifications in your browser automatically. And then the OSINT research angle to this again, it's like the DNS examination. You know, we're looking at the link, we're looking at the name, we're looking at the URL, we're looking at the reputation of the site. And the URL string examination is particularly handy because you can see the parameters changing and then, you know, it would, if it redirects to a different website, then um, it already there's, there could be a problem in there. So um, that's really it. I left a couple of minutes for questions. And if you want to follow me uh, on my uh, blog, I actually put a post just minutes ago with resources because look, there's a lot that could be discussed here. I have no way of putting all this in the slides, but head over to osinme.com, have a look at the resources that I posted in there. And um, yeah, any questions there, I'm here.